Very good. So the subject that we're going to take up this morning is the Lord's Supper. Among right dividers, there is a difference of opinion. Some will view the Lord's Supper as not being for today. Some view it as for today. I'm going to try to convince you this morning that it is for today, and I'll show you why I think that. Before we jump into that, that there's a, a well-known adage, and I, I guess I'll just quote that to you. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And I personally believe that that adage is scriptural. There are verses that support each of those concepts. And I'd, I'd encourage you to, to think about things that way. That In other words, in essential doctrines, you want to have unity. In non-essential doctrines, you ought to have liberty. And in all things, charity. Too many times, um, th th there's just a lack of grace among folks, and it's, it's not helpful. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. As you think about the question of the Lord's Supper today, you're going to focus on the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, some will say that we're not to practice the Lord's Supper today. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. The cup of blessing which we, which includes Paul, bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now, if you just read those verses, isn't it kind of obvious that Paul's practicing the Lord's Supper? Does those verses sound like Paul is saying, don't practice the Lord's Supper, it's not something we're supposed to do today? Or does he talk about the fact that he himself practices it and that it's, a, it's appropriate to, obviously, in some manner. Now, you're not supposed to drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, but if you weren't supposed to drink of the cup of the Lord at all, it would say, don't do it. And it, it doesn't say anything of the sort. So it seems to me it's rather plain that the, the Lord's table, communion, the Lord's supper, is proper for today, but there are instructions as to how to properly observe it. And so we'll spend some time looking at that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. We'll spend most of our time today in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul is our pattern. We're to follow him. We are to follow him for what reason? Because he followed Christ. We don't worship Paul because we think Paul as a man is a, any great thing, but we understand that he was given revelation from the Lord. And because Paul was given revelation from the Lord, it's appropriate to follow Paul as he follows the Lord. Look at verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. Notice this next part. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now we're going to come back to verse 2, but get Ephesians 2.15 just for a minute. Ephesians 2.15. When people think about the Lord's Supper, they often think about it in connection with water baptism. Much of the church today will say there are two ordinances that we are to keep, and those two ordinances are water baptism and the Lord's Supper. That position obviously is wrong because water baptism is not for today. Many react to that position. So in other words, the, 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 the traditional fundamentalist position is there are two ordinances for today, water baptism and the Lord's Supper. 
as you start to understand some dispensational truth, you realize, well, that the traditional position is just wrong. Water baptism is not an ordinance for today. So many right dividers will react to that by concluding what? Well, we shouldn't keep the water baptism today, so we shouldn't keep the Lord's Supper. Now look with me at Ephesians 2.15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So Ephesians 2.15 says pretty clearly that what has God done to ordinances? He's gotten rid of them. So when someone says, well, there's two ordinances for the body of Christ, a lot of people think, well, Ephesians 2.15, God got rid of the ordinances, so there are no ordinances today. But let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. Now notice this. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Well, in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul talks about keeping the ordinances. In Ephesians 2.15, it talks about abolishing the commandments contained in ordinances. So which is it? Are, are the commandments and the ordinances abolished, or there are, th or are there things we're supposed to keep? Which is it? Well, let me ask you this question: Are you under the Old Testament law during the dispensation of grace? Now, the precise answer is: You're not under the Old Testament law during the dispensation of grace. If what? If you're saved. If you're not saved, are you under the Old Testament law today? Yes, you are. So now let me ask a follow-up question. Are there, even so as a saved person, you are not under the Old Testament law today. Are there commandments that are given to you? Yes. Get 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So here's the thing to notice, and it's, it's really simple, but it's often confused. As a believer today, you are not under the Old Testament law, period, the end. You are not under the ordinances of the Old Testament law. They're, they're simply not something that are given to you to obey. But are there commandments that are Pauline commandments that you should obey? Sure there are. When, when, when Paul says, preach the word, is that a commandment that we're under? Yes. When, when he says, rejoice evermore, when, when he says, pray without ceasing, when he says, in all things give thanks. There, there's an, there are many, many, many Pauline commandments that we are under. In 1 Corinthians 11, 2, are there ordinances that we are under? Yet, yes, there are. That, that's very clearly the case. All right, so with that understanding, go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll go to verse 20. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Some will understand that commandment, or that, that verse, I should say. They'll understand that verse as a command not to observe the Lord's Supper. Is that actually what it says? Let's read it again. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That verse isn't a commandment not to observe the Lord's Supper. It's saying what you guys are doing is not a proper observance of the Lord's Supper. 
How do I know that? Look at verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. In 1 Corinthians 11, what Paul is doing is he is rebuking and correcting how the Corinthians were observing the Lord's Supper. He doesn't say not to do it. He's saying what you guys are doing is ridiculous. It's not an observance of the Lord's Supper. So when we observe the Lord's Supper later, if any of you get drunk, you're not doing it right. That's the idea of what Paul is saying there. There are a couple arguments that, that, that are used as to why we shouldn't observe the Lord's Supper today. Some will say we shouldn't observe it because it's an ordinance and we're not under ordinances. Well, we saw why that argument was wrong because 1 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul said that there were ordinances that he delivered unto them. A second argument is that Paul never instructs us anywhere to practice it. That argument, I think, is wrong based upon what we just saw in 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul indicated that he himself observed it. Let me show you, I'll show you three different reasons as to why it seems to me the Lord's Supper is for today. And the first is that Paul's manner of writing assumes that the Corinthians will practice the Lord's Supper. So look with me at verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, doesn't it sound like that's something he expects them to do? As often as they do it? He doesn't say don't do it. He says as often as you do it, here's what you're doing. You're showing the Lord's death. Look at verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Isn't that even a commandment? What it says is examine yourself, and then what? And then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Now let's contrast this with something. Does Paul ever say that the spiritual gifts will cease? Doesn't he specifically say in 1 Corinthians 13 that tongues shall cease? When he says tongues shall cease, is he saying human language is going to stop being used? He's obviously saying the gift of tongues will cease. My point in telling you that is Paul and Scripture are very capable of saying if there's a practice that's going to end, he says it, right? Tongue shall cease. Well, he never says anything like that with the Lord's Supper. And in fact, he gives instructions as to how to properly observe it. That's the first point. The second point is this. We'll look at a couple verses here. As we look at the verses, ask yourself this question. Is Paul criticizing the Corinthians for observing the Lord's Supper, or is he criticizing how they observe the Lord's Supper? You understand the question? You know, is he, is he saying, shame on you for observing the Lord's Supper, or is he saying, the way you're doing it, is wrong. So look with me at verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Well, he doesn't say don't eat. He says in eating, the way that you're doing it, some are hungry and some are drunken. You're doing it the wrong way. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
what I just do? I skipped one word, didn't I? So the way that I read it, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. If that's what it said, it would be saying, don't do it, right? In other words, if you eat of, of the body and of the bread, uh, shame on you. You're doing something you shouldn't. But that's not what the verse says. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What part of speech is the word unworthily? Well done. Adverb. Now, how can you tell it's an adverb? It ends in L-Y. An adverb does what? It modifies a verb. It describes the manner of doing something. So if I say, I cooked, I is the subject, cooked is the verb. That means I cooked, which you know is a false statement and I shouldn't do that. <laughs> But if I say, I cooked horribly, horribly would describe the manner in which I cooked, right? I cooked fantastically, another lie. What is Paul saying in verse 27, obviously? If you observe this, not at all, but if you observe this unworthily, if you do it in an undignified irreverent manner, then you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Again, an adverb, again, describing the manner in which they did this. Isn't it more than obvious? If you tell someone, hey, the way you're doing this is wrong, it assumes there's not something wrong with simply doing it, right? In other words, it's okay to observe the Lord's Supper, but don't observe it in this horrible fashion. So when you read 1 Corinthians 11, it's actually rather plain that, it's inst that it is instructions for the observance of the Lord's Supper today. I'll show you one more thing uh, on this. Look with me at... at uh, Look at verse, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 for a minute. We'll come back to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. What... Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, is he's saying, I delivered to you, I gave to you Corinthians this information that I what? Received. In other words, God gave him some information that Paul then delivered unto the Corinthians. That's what an Old Testament prophet would do. How did God speak to Israel? Well, God would speak to a prophet, and then what would the prophet do? The prophet would relay that information to the audience. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, when Paul talks about his gospel, he says, I delivered unto you that which I also received. In other words, I'm not just giving you my opinion. This is something I received from God that I'm telling you. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Do you see how verse 23 is essentially the same formulation as 1 Corinthians 15, 3? The reason we preach Paul's gospel today is the Lord Jesus Christ gave information directly to Paul that he received, and then Paul was to deliver it to mankind. 
Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was sent to the apostles with a message that God had given him. God uses that exact same language to describe the revelation of the Lord's Supper to Paul. I'll put it this way. If you decide, well, I'm not going to observe the Lord's Supper because I don't think it's for today, then what you are doing is you are not observing information in 1 Corinthians 11 that's described in the exact same way as Paul's gospel. So if you're not going to observe the Lord's Supper, maybe you shouldn't observe Paul's gospel either. Now you have freedom to choose how to do this, but my point is, did, did Scripture use those words by accident? And God accidentally confused it and He made it seem like the Lord's Supper was delivered to Paul when it really wasn't? No, it's, it's, it's rather obvious that it was specific revelation given to Paul uh, that, you know, that, that obviously we should observe. All right, so go back with me to 1 Corinthians 11 and let's look at verse 21 again. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. And obviously what's going on there is it's kind of chaos, right? It's not a respectful thing. Some at the front of the line take a bunch of food and there's nothing left, so some people are hungry. Some apparently were drinking wine and they got drunk, which obviously that's an indecent way to observe the Lord's Supper. Verse 22, What have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And obviously what Paul's doing is he's critiquing the manner in which they observe this. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. With regard to the Lord's Supper, there are generally four different views as to what takes place when the Lord's Supper is observed. The first is transubstantiation. What is transubstantiation? Transubstantiation is that when the elements of the Lord's Supper are blessed, the bread and the wine, it literally becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, is that what actually happens? Does Scripture command on multiple occasions not to consume blood? It does, right? So if transubstantiation actually took place, you would be consuming blood in violation of the, the verses that tell you not to do that, including in, in Acts 15. I'll share with you one thing. I had, a, I had a friend many years ago who was an altar boy in an organization where they believed in transubstantiation. And what happened was this. When the wine is blessed, it becomes the blood of Christ. Well, you can't take the blood of Christ and pour it in the sink if there's some left over. So what has to happen at the conclusion of the ceremony with the wine that's left? You have to drink it. And so my friend who was an altar boy, he would come home from services drunk because he would finish the wine that had been supposedly transubstantiated into the blood of Christ. By the way, if he got drunk on it, doesn't that tell you that it didn't actually become the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ did not have that high a blood alcohol content? 
right? So transubstantiation is not what happens. Luther was an advocate of consubstantiation. What does the word con mean, the prefix con? Con means with. So chili con carne is chili with meat. Consubstantiation is the idea of the real presence. In other words, the elements, the bread and the wine, are not actually transformed into the body and blood of Christ, but Jesus Christ is, in a sense, has a real presence when the Lord's Supper is observed. Is that what's going on? Well, let me give you the third option. The third option is called spiritual presence. And the idea of that is that Jesus Christ isn't really physically present in the elements, but that he is spiritually present. And therefore, by partaking, you receive a spiritual blessing. And here's the fourth option. The fourth option is that the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Look at verse 24 and 25 again. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in what? Remembrance. Verse 25. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. It seems rather clear that the scriptural option is that what happens at the Lord's Supper, it's not that the elements somehow are transformed and their chemical nature changed so that they become another substance or that the body and blood of Christ is really present or spiritually present. It's simply a memorial. It's a commemoration. It's a remembrance of the Lord's sacrifice for us. Look with me at verse 27. Well, let's read verse 26 first. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. What, what is happening when you observe the Lord's Supper is you're showing, you're commemorating his death. That's what it is. It's, it's a memorial. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What many will say about that verse is, before you partake of the Lord's Supper, you need to make sure your life is in order. You better not have unconfessed sin in your life. You better be living properly if you're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Is that what that verse means? Is anyone comfortable saying, I've examined my life and I'm hitting it out of the park? I, I, I am doing just such a great job that I'm surprised the Lord doesn't come right now and take me to heaven. I mean, you, you can't sincerely believe that. We talked earlier about unworthily. So the word unworthily is an adverb. It modifies a verb. So let's read this verse one more time and tell me what verb is being modified by unworthily. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So what are the, there's actually two verbs that are being modified by unworthily. What are they? Eat and drink. It's not modifying the verb, your manner of living. What's being described there is when people eat and drink in a way, imagine this. Imagine observing the Lord's Supper where you drink so much you become drunk. Well, would that be a worthy way of commemorating the Lord's death for your sin? 
Obviously not. Imagine having the Lord's Supper, and what happens is you bring a bunch of food for yourself to eat, and some of the other folks don't have anything, and so you pig out, get drunk, and pass out, and these folks are hungry. It, it, it is just a undignified, irreverent, unscriptural, unholy, wrong way to do things. That is what is being criticized in verse 27. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. What Paul's saying there to the Corinthians is, you know, pay attention to what you're doing, right? F focus on this so that you would, will observe this in a way that is proper. Now, verse 27, let's just notice this, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. The idea there is, if you're participating in a remembrance of the Lord's death, and you do so in a way that is irreverent, you're, you're guilty of, of disrespecting the Lord's blood. The, the, the idea there is, Jesus Christ on the cross died for all of man's sin. He, he bore that penalty. Jesus Christ is so extraordinary that he can, in a finite time, pay for the eternal penalty that you would have to pay. And when he died on the cross, when the Lord says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That, that is the Lord being made sin, the, the righteous, pure Lord Jesus Christ being made sin for man, the Father forsaking him temporarily on the cross, and the Lord enduring that, that wrath, that, that indignation, and so on. So imagine remembering that event in a way that is sloppy and crude and undignified. It's just, it's a horrible thing to do, and that's what was going on in Corinth at that time. Look with me at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, and isn't that verse clear, right? It's about the manner of observance. Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Is the damnation in that verse that God gets upset with how you're observing the Lord's Supper, and He says, I'm going to send you to the lake of fire. If that were true, then eternal security isn't really a thing. Right? So the damnation that's being described occurs at what point in time, or at what event? It's the judgment seat of Christ. So as you think about your service to the Lord, what happens at the judgment seat of Christ is your work is evaluated. That includes the things you have done in the body of Christ. Well, for the Corinthians, they're going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ, and the time they spent drunk at the Lord's Supper, is God going to say, well, I'm going to give you a reward for that? Well, He's not going to give them a reward for that, because that's not gold, silver, precious stones. What is it? It's wood, hay, and stubble. So are they going to experience damnation? Yeah, they're going to experience the, the, the condemnation of that service. Doesn't mean they're going to lose their salvation, but God's certainly not going to praise them for it. And then notice the last part of verse 29, not discerning the Lord's body. What it's saying there is they obviously aren't, they don't understand the significance of the event they are participating in or they wouldn't observe it in a manner that's so unworthy. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What verse 30 is describing is it's describing chastening, it's describing correction that the Corinthians received as a result of improperly observing the Lord's Supper. So when we observe the Lord's Supper today, is God, if you, and if you do it wrong, is God going to make you weak and sickly and many sleep? 
In the scriptures, what is sleep often ref, uh, a euphemism for, or what does it often refer to? Death. So is God, if we really mess this up today, are we going to have to call the squad and, or, or the mortician and say, hey, we've got some customers for you? No, because how does God correct us today? What does 2 Timothy 3.16 tell you is one of the functions of the Word of God? It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, and what? Correction. So does God correct us today by, from heaven, causing problems in our life? No, He doesn't do that today. The way that He corrects us is through the Word. That's one of the reasons that we need to be studying it and understanding it. All right, look with me then at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. That's to be respectful. It's not to run to the head of the line and eat everything. Verse 34, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So maybe one or two more thoughts on this. One of the things that you do when you observe the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, communion, is you, you rejoice in what the Lord did for you. He drank the cup of wrath so that we could drink the cup of blessing, right? And, and so that's a joyous thing, but it's a, it's a serious thing also, right? And, and that's why you want to observe it in a way that is dignified and proper. And so that is, uh, that is what we will endeavor to do. We're going to stop there, and uh, we'll take a brief break, and then we'll uh, pick up the, at the 1030 service. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the fact that you have recorded in the Scriptures the information we need to know about the Lord's Supper and, and other topics. Help us to be diligent about searching these things out, that we might honor you in all that we do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.